Thinking Basketball Podcast. My name is Ben. Welcome back to a new season. It is the 2023-24 NBA season, or as it will historically be known, henceforth the 2024 season. Who needs October and November and December to be included in the calendar when you cross over the new year like our blessed NBA season does? Cody, how are you feeling? We are uh, we're on the precipice of yet another year, the eve of a kickoff. The, uh, the season kicks off tonight. We're recording this on Tuesday, October 24th, 2023. Let's get right into it. Who's going to win the title? Who? Oh, my goodness. I, I was just going to back up for a second and say it's weird because we're talking about, like, we're back, NBA's here, this is going to be great. But, like, we've been re- recording for the last, like, multiple months going back through history. So, like, I don't know what's different, but, Ben, it feels different. There's, like, a different – there's an exciting energy going on with the season. And in terms of who's going to win the championship – I'll, I'll tell okay, you what's fine, different. Fine. Let me let me tell you what's different, okay? Tell me what's different. Tell Unlike what's during different. the summer, people are here listening to us. That's <laughs> – <laughs> That's what's different. Yeah, we're not talking to ourselves. So I don't know why, you know, we've been going down memory lane all off season. I just spent a long time making a video on Manu Ginobili. But now, mm. now we look forward. We look to the new generation of San Antonio Spurs. Uh, we'll talk about them today. Where, where do you want to start? You want to start in the East? You want to start in the West? Who's going to win the Rookie of the Year? There's so many questions. That well, we you've have asked to me two of them. Do you want me to answer either of those questions right now? or Because I'll, t- I'll tell you what. I'll give you my finals prediction right now. I'll give you my championship, Ben. No, don't I'm do it. Start. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't. Okay. No, okay. not yet. Okay. So you've been watching the preseason, right? A little bit. Like, I didn't, like, crush the tape like I know some people did. Because I was kind of, when I was prepping for this, I was watching a lot of last year. But then I'm like, you know what? I should, I should get a feel for what people look like in some of these new rosters. So I didn't watch every team, but I definitely dab a little bit in the preseason. Well, I mean, before we get to a specific team, the big question in my head, let's kick off with this question. Okay. I feel like we need music to kick off these questions. Um, do you think any team is going to win 60 games? Because no team won 60 games last year. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think two teams, the Bucks and maybe the Celtics, 58 and 57, everyone else is like below 55. The year before, we had something like that where the Suns, got up to 64 but no other team was over like 56 the year before I don't think we had one I know I know 2020 with the abbreviated season and the Milwaukee was about the Milwaukee uh the Bucks were (laughs) about to hit 60 before the season shut down so there's a lot of parody we've talked about it for the last few seasons on the preview show uh last year very very competitive league especially in the west where teams are very closely crunched together and you said you were like looking back at last year What's your feel on this? Do you think we are tightly wound and, and compressed and the margin for error at the top is very small? Or do you think there's a couple teams like when you're going through and surveying the landscape, did teams jump out to you? Well, I think to build off what you're saying, I think one team has the potential to hit 60 wins. But I think the thing that I was thinking about is that I don't know how many teams are going to be above 55 wins. Like, I think there might be one team over 55 wins, and everyone else is going to kind of be, you know, topping off in that 53, 54. Maybe somebody hits 55, but I really think that the top of the league is going to top out there after we hit, like, the number one team. Yeah, well, health is a huge thing, right? Mm-hmm. Because players, if you if your best players play 60, 65 games, and you perform really poorly in those other games, it's hard to get over 55 wins. Because uh, even if you play at like a 60 win pace when you're healthy, that'll drag you down. The other thing, and we're going to talk about this next week probably, or or certainly next month as it as it rolls around. We have the NBA Cup this year, so the beginning of the season, you got you got the NBA Cup on Tuesdays and Fridays. You're going to have a competitive first six weeks of the year. You think no one's going to pay attention to this? I'm a truther. I'm very excited about it. We'll talk about it when it rolls around. And then in addition to that. We have the what are what is it the anti load management rules where you're not yeah. supposed to rest players on certain things and in addition to that the fewest back to backs in an NBA schedule in history where the average team has something like nine back to back games scheduled this year which is an all time low so the league has put in all of these regular season measures basically to try to make it so that the best players can hopefully all play 70 something games uh, on the top teams. But, you know, I think when we talk about parity, 
when you when you add in the fact that guys have only been playing 60 65 games it's like yeah no wonder why at the end of the season the the one seed is at 54 wins and the eight seed is at 45 wins or whatever it is i think on top of that too there's one more thing that the league has instilled and that's the awards incentives right isn't it the fact that you can't like make it to an all nba team or mvp or something like that unless you hit uh what is it 50 is it 56 some number it, yeah it, it's, it's a number it's some number like that so there's yeah. mul- like you said multiple guardrails that are really trying to push teams to not sit their guys like ever so i'm really interested to see how much all of those things along with your your cherished in-season tournament ben i want to hear i want to see how all of those things help make the regular season feel even more uh you know necessary okay i know there's one team that you think has a chance to win 60 games just one you've said no other team could possibly do it absolutely 100 percent not going to happen but before before we get there uh is there i, I like to start my like survey of the new year with teams that I think are going to surprise or make a jump are young teams aging up the curve and, and coming together and surprising you. Are they taking that leap to get into the playoffs or a team at the back of the playoffs? Can they jump to the top of the conference? Any candidates for you? We can pick a conference. We can start on either side and get ourselves going. Uh, But that's kind of where my mind goes right away. Trying to find those teams. that are going to shake up the landscape from the year before. I think Ben, one of my predictions, one of my hot takes I'm going to come out with right now is that I think that the Minnesota Timberwolves are going to have a top three seed in the West. Oh, my goodness. Is this the third straight year you've had this prediction? I don't it, have I have I always <laughs> been up on the Timberwolves? Is this a team that I seem to like every year? Uh, I think after the Gobert trade, which that was last year, you I think you had a very similar thought when we talked about the Gobert trade. Yeah. Okay, so, you know, we've had a year. I thought Gobert had an off year last year. We talked about that a good amount. I don't necessarily think that last year is indicative of the impact that Gobert is going to bring. Uh, Carl Anthony Towns played, like, what, like 30? <laughs> he played, like, 30 games last year, and he was injured for some of it, right? He Maybe it was 50 games. I don't know, everyone. We're in a new season. We're wiping our memories clean. 29. 29 tw- games. Hey, yeah. look, look at that. Yeah. I'm right in the ballpark. Someone give me some credit. Give me some, give me a gold star to start That was, good. That was impressive, yeah. Okay, thank yeah. you. So Gobert and Cat have a little bit more time to gel. Uh, Anthony Edwards is obviously everyone's darling, especially coming off the uh, the Team USA types of performances where you know Steve Kerr is out there being like, this guy is absolutely incredible. Jaden McDaniels just signed an extension with them, so he's feeling a little bit more comfortable there. Mike Conley, just you know the best old man player you can have out there that's going to be starting. He brings a nice presence to the locker room. I think this team is really geared to make another step forward. We, You know, Nas Reed signed a nice contract at the end of last season, too, or sometime in the, the offseason here. I just think that this team has had another year to gel together. You watch the preseason, Kyle Anderson's just throwing, like, off-the-bounce, underhanded lobs to Gobert, and it's like, this team's, this team's great. I think they're going to be competing in the top half of the West. I like that. I like that a lot. The only thing that gives me pause with Minnesota... I rarely ever feel this way about players. Uh, I'm trying to think of how many other times I've thought this. I kind of feel like to get full Minnesota going forward, they need to trade towns. That's, wow. that's yeah, I've been in that headspace. Ooh. I just don't like the fit with both the big men. I don't, I don't like it. What sort of a player? Like, you don't have to give me a player. Like, I don't, I don't like playing the trade machine. Like the actual, like, oh, the cap doesn't work, blah, blah, I don't care. We're playing 2K, uh, taking off all guardrails here. What kind of player would you want to get in return for Cat? I like Jason Tatum. I think that would be a good oh. <laughs> a good player. Uh, no, I, I think a, a wing, a big wing that can shoot okay. is sort of the baseline that you want to start with there. Um, I think, you know, if you're ac- asking about optimizing the lineup, you have to decide – how much you're going to run the offense through Anthony Edwards. It gets interesting in today's game. You know, we've talked about this rise of heliocentrism and relying on one player. And it's like you have your best player, but if you're still running a ton of offense that involves ball screens and pick and roll and things like that, and he's not a great passer in that situation, do you want to divvy that up? I mean, Anthony Edwards can play off ball a little bit, A, as a shooter, B, attacking closeouts and getting downhill on cuts and things like that. So... Would you try to stack the lineup a little differently? Conley's getting older. Could you get someone else as another on-ball presence? I mean, that that would be what's in my head. But just conceptually, I've, I really like the direction. Everything you laid out, I like. But then I have a hard time with both 
Gobert being on the court and it working for Towns and Towns being on the court and working for Gobert. So I think in Towns' case, you, he could go somewhere else and be uh, probably more productive and more successful with something built around his strengths. But I don't, I'm not saying I disagree with you. I, I like everything you laid out. I just have this thing in my head that there isn't an ideal fit there. There's a conflict there. And I feel like if you really want to unlock everything you're talking about, and it could work, it, we don't know it's going to work yet, but the... Gobert, Gobert looked good in the preseason games that I've seen. Obviously, we like McDaniels around here. And then Anthony Edwards ascending uh, to an upper echelon player. Like, it feels like the figuring out how to get Cat and optimize Cat. And that is the tricky part for me. So which which direction of the fit makes you most nervous if they keep the big men together? Is it the offensive fit between Cat and Gobert? Or is it the defensive fit between them? Hmm, I don't know. I think it's just a two-way thing. Because you, you can't. You can't get the best of both worlds. Okay. So, uh, so I don't. It's not one particular side of the ball. But this feels so negative yeah. to start with. It feels so negative. I just um, said the Timberwolves are going to be a top three in the West. That's, no, that's I, I mean on my I part, I'm. I feel like I'm. I'm dousing water on your one of your teams that you're very excited about. So so let's stick in the West, okay? okay. Um, if Minnesota is in the top three, mm-hmm. does that mean that? Phoenix is also in the top three. I have them penciled in as a probable <laughs> top three. I have them okay. penciled in. Okay, and then I and then here's the here's the big question: Is the other top three team in the West Denver? Yes, that's the other penciled in. Team. Did you just hold up YouTube crowd? I need everyone to slow this mm-hmm. frame down. Did you just roll your eyes at me for my Denver pick there? No, no, I didn't roll my eyes, but it's uh, it felt like an eye roll. No. This is very, it wasn't the Denver part. It was, it's, it, think about, I really like what you're saying. You're really, you're really loving Minnesota. I am loving Minnesota. Is there something about the top three that feels wrong to you? Like out of those three, which of those three do you think has the least likely chance of being in the top three? Well, I have, I have a different top three. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I have a different top three, but as many listeners know, uh, we don't go through and rank the order of picks and things like this and, um, you know, say this team's going to be first, this team's going to be second. I tend to think about the tiers the teams are in, especially as we head to the postseason, and then sort of the ranges that are interesting. Can a team, can a team make a big run to the top? So we're together on Denver. They're, they're the defending champs. Uh, they lose Bruce Brown. But I think they have enough depth off the bench. They lose Jeff Green, but I think they have enough depth. They have a bunch of young rookie wings that have been playing a ton in the preseason. All they really need is for like one of those guys to be a rotation player. I think they'll get one of those guys to be a rotation player. And then, of course, health. And I think they'll be right around top three in the regular season in the West. Top four, we can, we can you know nitpick on how close the standings are going to be, but I have Denver there. Phoenix... So the- Oh, yeah, no, jump in on Denver, sure. Yeah, here's a point about uh, Denver. And like you were talking about earlier, when you talk about guys that play a lot of the season, like Jokic comparatively to a lot of other uh, exactly. of the, the, yeah. the best players in the league, he plays most of the season. He's a walking, like, 125 offensive rating. Like, he's just yeah. going to give you that. But the the Bruce Brown of it all, you know, I've talked a lot about how much I appreciate Bruce Brown, especially his synergy with Jokic. But I think something that's frustrated me is it feels like people are – acting like Christian Brown is going to be able to just like, we're just going to do a Brown for Brown swap. Like it's going to be the same sort of thing. And I think Christian Brown brings size and great defensive chops and the athleticism. But I think that's really underplaying the creation burden that Brown was able to pick up. Like I think his passing game was good. His driving game was good. And I don't think Christian Brown's able to, to replicate that. So I'm interested to see where they get some of that combination of defense and offensive juice off the bench. I think that's the thing that concerns me the most, but in the regular season for right now, Honestly, Jokic and if Murray's playing it, I don't know, 80% of what he was in the playoffs, like they should be in the top three of the conference. Yeah. Phoenix, Phoenix is a more interesting question. Um, you know, how how good is their offense going to be with, the, with those three guys out there? How hard is it going to be to guard? I have not been able to get a feel in the preseason. Um, you know, the three of them played together in one game. Nurkic wasn't in that game. It didn't really look like there's a ton of complex actions that were put into place. So they're just kind of like playing someone comes and sets a someone comes and sets a pick and someone else goes and, you know, 
pickup ball style 2024 basketball. Nothing, nothing too complicated. Uh, but obviously, you've got three guys that can shoot. You've got three guys that can play on ball. You've got three guys that can play off ball. And I think when we consider the regular season standings, one, health. Um, you know, is Kevin Durant going to be able to play 65 games? Are they going to be healthy and play together for a good chunk of the season? Um, second, <laughs> second, where was I talking about? <laughs> Phoenix Suns and their, uh, and their brand of offensive basketball. Uh, yeah, the Phoenix Suns. Um, so, okay. So all I'm, all I'm getting at with the Suns is if league average offensive rating is like 115, let's just say it's 115 or something. If the Suns are able to generate a 120 offensive rating because the combination of the three things that I just laid out is really difficult to guard um, and they have enough sets that make it really difficult to guard, then even an average defense, like a league average defense, gets you into the 50-something win club. And if we expect there aren't that many teams that can push 55 wins, that probably gets you in the top four. Um, so that's my thinking with Phoenix. But, I mean, is there a low? Like, what's the low What's the low end for Phoenix? Is it just health-related? Is it is it that they really have no depth and you need depth in 2024 to be able to defend well and they might have a really, really porous defense? Like, what what is the kind of pessimistic view of this team for you that's a great question just because I don't know what to make of their very interesting rotation of big men because they're the best way to describe the big men that they have on their team is like a bunch of dudes that if you squint like you have the twitter heads that have like bragged about these guys in some capacity right you have Nurkic who like you know once upon a time could pass like up top nice little bounce pass could uh protect the rim a little bit we haven't really seen that since like the bubble too much he, he, he can still pass he can still pass the the defense though i don't think that's quite as uh potent as it once was uh drew eubanks i think he's got some nice blocking chops so maybe some good rim protection chops i don't know how much of like a full-blown paint protector he is but that's a strong dude he just posterized someone the other day in in preseason so that's cool jamezi metu Coming from uh, once upon a time, he was with the Orlando Magic. That's another dude that like the you Kings. squint and you're like, okay, this guy. Oh, he's from the Kings. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. Everyone that seems I, good, I'm just gonna put from the Magic. Yes, yes. Cody is I, very then, Orlando uh, pilled. We'll get to that later in the in the show. And uh. then Bull Bull, who was actually on the Orlando Magic. Like these are four dudes that you're like. I don't know. You can all put them out in certain spots. You're not going to rely on any of them to play 35 minutes a night. But how useful is it to just kind of like rotate these guys in once in a while to fit in with the Durant, Booker, Beal of it all? And I, I think that's the most interesting part of it. I also want to see the point guard aspect of it. Like, is Beal actually going to play most of the point guard position for them? Are they going to try and bring somebody else in to fit there? I don't even know how that works with the, the buyout market in terms of where they are with the cap right now. So uh, the big men rotation and then the point guard rotation, those are two things I'm going to be watching very closely with them. I completely forgot about Bull Bull, the Victor Wembenyama of the Northwest. So, I, I mean, now that you've mentioned that, my concerns about their defense have been totally alleviated. Um, they'll probably win 75 games. <laughs> Sorry, Cody, did you spit out your water on that, that one? Really clo- that okay. was really I, close. Okay, <laughs> I should have probably reined that in once I realized Cody was drinking water, um, <laughs> if you're listening and not watching. So, yeah, I... I don't know what they're going to do at the big position. I think their ultimate best lineup is probably going to have none of those players on the court. That's that's my hunch. I don't know how they figure that out. I don't know if they get like uh, a player like Yuta Watanabe or Bates Diop or um, you know even Kevin Durant, like one of those guys playing center, quote unquote center, in a smaller lineup. But I I don't have a like regular season. You can eat up the you can eat up the minutes with the players you mentioned. The thing that concerns me about Nurkic is just the health and his movement and recovering from everything that he's sort of been through in the last few seasons. So I guess that's more playoff facing, but in the regular season, what would that mean if none of those things work? I, I think from watching them in preseason, I think they have the depth. They have their your old friend, Grayson Allen. I think they have enough bodies to throw out there around these guys. So I think they'll be able to uh, to have a fairly high floor in the regular season. For me, the question is about the ceiling and what that offense can generate. And like, if we're in 2024 
is there another step forward for strategy in the NBA? We've just been going through this rapid, rapid change, right? And we've documented it and we've talked a lot about it. And, you know, did it start in 2012? Did it start in 2015? When did it kick off? It's accelerated in the last five years. Is it, is it an S-curve? Is it like rapid acceleration? And now we're tapering off because we're maturing. We've kind of figured out like, all right, you want space. You want shooting. You want pace. You want a ton of movement. You want a ton of set of screens. Set a ton of screens. You don't want to be stationary and use a single ball screen. You want to use multiple ball screens and use a lot of movement. I didn't really see anything in the preseason that was oh, where did they get these X's and O's from like South America or Eastern Europe? Like, where's this coming from? It's more of what we've seen and how many little tweaks. Uh, Mike De La Rosa on the Thinking Basketball YouTube channel just had a really interesting video on the, uh, the way the Thunder used screening actions with their guards. So all these inverted pick and rolls and all the little creative things they can do by sprinting into the screens with their guards. I mean, that to me is more marginal than some of the bigger changes we've seen in the last few seasons. So I'm looking for teams that are going to use pace more as something that is still an area where you can get value on the margins. But I'm wondering if there's nothing innovative, um, you know, is there someone that can have that step forward this season? And if not, does that mean we shouldn't expect a, a 121 offensive rating or 123 offensive rating from one of these teams like Phoenix or something like that? Well, you know, do you think that the Sacramento Kings are going to be able to keep hitting the league in the way that they did? Like, they, I think they kind of took the league by surprise last year, and you had a breakdown last year talking about their offense, their high-octane offense led by uh, what's De'Aaron Fox. That's just, De'Aaron Fox, uh, Sabonis, I yes. can't remember his name. It, we're, we're warming De- up everyone. Yes, Demonis Sabonis De- and De'Aaron De- Fox. Sabonis. Yes, um, But yes. the fact that they Kelvin had such Quarter, a high... Kelvin Puerter, yes. Yeah. <laughs> they had a great offense. Can they keep that up? being under the tutelage of Mike Brown for a second year in a row. Like, I don't know. Part of me thinks that if they gel together, I don't know if they'll have the same health luck because last year I think their five, their starting five played a lot of minutes together. And I know Sabonis played most of the season through an injury. And I think part of that helped to boost some of their regular season offense. But I could see them taking that offense to another step by just like solidifying what they did so well by pushing the pace, having Malik Monk come off the bench, Kevin Herter spacing the floor, the passing, De'Aaron Fox's speed, and his ability to sort of rein it in. Uh, I think there's a chance that the Kings, again, are near the top of the league in offense. Or Keegan Murray, someone like that. You always look for second- and third-year players who can take the existing shell of what's successful last year and then improve it with better shooting, or in his case, maybe a little more on-ball responsibility uh, playmaking or taking those actions that they have and attacking off the dribble in dynamic sets and and either scoring himself or passing off the bounce. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know, but these are the big questions when I when I look at the top teams. We haven't talked about the other team. Well, actually, I have two other teams. Maybe I have three other teams. I'm gonna go with two. I'm gonna go with two. <laughs> There's actually like 27 other teams. Ben. Yeah, we got we got no, a long way to go. Two other teams in the West that I yeah. have sort of earmarked here um and then we'll get into other ones i want to talk about see minnesota was on my next line minnesota was on my next line i didn't have minnesota up in this in this category so i'm glad that you are coming out swinging like this because it's like how many teams could finish with the best record in the west that seems like a long list how many teams could win the west seems like a smaller list but how many teams could finish with the one seed uh, seems like a long list. And the next team that I wrote down here that I think looks very good and they're very dangerous and they're suddenly deep. And I'm, I mean, I'm not going to say they have like a dark horse MVP candidate, but Cody has no idea who I'm talking about. And this is awesome. The LA Lakers. Wow. Yeah. You're going to bring up the lake. Okay. Well, I'm going to bring up the Lakers cause they, they're one of the teams in the West. Yeah. And they're, and they're good. Okay. What about the Lakers? Because last year, the regular season was a little meh. Like we came off on a high note, more I, as high of a note as a sweep can well, be. Well, they had an old they had an old team. They have a new team. They got a new team around LeBron James and Anthony Davis, and then all of a sudden they got very good. And so I think part of that to use a, a term that you like, I feel a little normy. I feel a little normcore 
being like, oh, that team that made the Western Conference Finals last year is also going to continue to be good. But what made them good? It was some addition by addition and some addition by subtraction. And so now you look at the team and you have Austin Reeves, who, again, to go back to what you said about Ann Edwards and playing in the World Cup, like... I thought he was their third best player last year in the playoffs, and I think he is a legitimately good starting shooting guard. You're going to get minutes in the regular season from D'Angelo Russell, who's not going to be as exposed defensively and things like that, and Gabe Vincent. Um, You also have on your team now Torian Prince as a 3 and D guy who's a veteran who can eat up minutes and kind of complement the stars around you. Rui Hachimura and then Jared Vanderbilt, Swiss Army Knife forward, defensive specialist. Again, probably won't be as exposed in the regular season, but I think the product is so mature now that on certain nights teams are going to, you know, gamble and 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 bet that they're just going to leave Vanderbilt in the corner so you don't expect him to play 35 minutes a game but this is the depth that they have Christian Wood off the bench in certain matchups in the regular season I think can give you some good minutes and then the top two guys and it's just so weird saying this but uh, I've watched a lot of basketball in my life and I trust my eyes at this point and one, Anthony Davis, we have to whisper this part, sorry. Anthony Davis looks really good. Uh, he look, he does, he does. The game I turned on the other day, he blocked five shots in the first six minutes of the game. Um, it's like you watch Victor Wembanyama and you're like, wow, he's an alien. You watch Anthony Davis and you're like, he's doing the same things, but he looks like less of an alien because he's not 7'4", he's 6'9". Just really, really looks good, especially on the defensive end. And then Cody, I'm going to play bingo for you. On this one, okay? okay. It's your fir- it's your first season preview show that we're doing together, and it's a momentous occasion. So I have to serve this up to you on a platter. LeBron James is going into, I mean, this hurts my head to say it. His twenty first season. He's going into his twenty first NBA season. He's made has he made like nineteen All NBA teams in a row. I don't even know what the number is, and. His basketball IQ is so high that I trust him to modulate down what he needs to do during the year, understanding I have a deeper team now. I have guys that can play pick and roll now with the ball. Austin Reeves can create with the ball. D'Angelo Russell can run the offense. We can run stuff through Anthony Davis or center a lot of our pick and roll game around his role and pop, gravity, and skill. Um, I don't need to be a guy that averages 27 and seven and plays 36 minutes every night. And so I think that allows him to pace himself and fill in in the other areas and still provide value on defense, switching, size, rebounding, uh, playmaking, cutting, little things like that. And he still looks really good physically. It doesn't even make any sense. He's, he's going to be 39 in two months, and uh, he, he, looks, he looks really, really good. And he had the foot injury last year in the playoffs, and he didn't, if he didn't have the foot injury last year in the playoffs, who knows what could have been. And so if you take some proxy of that, I think the total picture, I did not expect to spend six minutes making a case for the Lakers, but I did, they just look really good. Well, we're contractually obligated to talk about the Lakers for more than any other team, so it makes sense that we're we're talking this way. The podcast wouldn't even be able to go up. Uh, I don't. I can't. This is one of those. <laughs> You're saying Apple. Things. Apple would not allow it to go in the store. <laughs> no, they scan every NBA podcast. They wait for the Lakers section. They compare it to all other sections. And if it's not long, it's just down. It, it's either the bots uh, downgrade it or it's just removed. It's completely canceled, Ben. It's completely hey, canceled. Hey, who's on the clock for demanding a trade to a big market? Who is on the clock? I just, I, I'm getting that. In. Why would we, we would never talk about that. <laughs> We're no, just that, getting that's that true. in. That's the contractual. <laughs> All right, never mind. Keep going. Can we still talk about Damian Lillard? Like, is that still, can, does, are we still able to bring that conversation up? Does that get some, some points towards the Apple, the Apple overloads? I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't, We've, Ben, I don't, this is early. I'm going off vibes and I, I hate this so much. I don't, I just, I don't know why. I don't know why I'm not excited about the Lakers. You don't I think, think they're going to be good. I, I would hope they are. I like it when teams are good. I like it with teams that have players that I really like are good. But something about the regular seasons just seem to go awry. Like like you were just talking about. They seem to be deep. They have all these good players that seem to do well in the regular season. But Ben, Anthony Davis, LeBron James, these are not two guys that have been playing a lot of the season lately. 
And, you know, we can point to injuries and whatever else, but the fact of the matter is that some people get injured more. And LeBron seems to be at a stage in his career where he is not the Iron Man that he was a decade ago. A de- ben, a decade ago, he's not the Iron Man that he used to be, okay? And so that makes me a little bit nervous. So can this Lakers team, Ben, by your estimation, in a Western conference, that what I'm looking at, I don't know, there's... There's a lot of teams that seem really good. Can they weather a storm when either Anthony Davis, LeBron James, or both are out for 10, 15 games or something like that? Yeah, I think 10 or 15 games is fine. I mean, last year, LeBron played 55 games at 36 minutes a game in his age 38 season uh, near the league leaders in, in minutes played. That's not ideal. That's crazy. Anthony Davis played 56 games. And there was a stretch at the beginning of the year where he really started to come around. I think he looks again. I think he looks better right now hmm. than he did during that that stretch. He played 56 games. He is only going to be in his age 30 season. And I think if you can get 68 to 72 games from these guys, I think you can weather the storm with the rest of the roster in those other 10 or 15 games. And the most important thing to me is that. When those guys are out there, you have a large margin of victory over your opponent. Um, I'm not saying when they're healthy, they they're have to play like a 60 or 65 win team. But when they're on the court and you get those minutes together, if they indeed are successful and if they indeed still are really high level players, I think they can get you. I think that should get you to the top of the West or certainly near the top of the West, which is what we're, we're talking about here. I, I want to get to another team. Mm-hmm. I would say the other team, I'll say the other team that I think can can finish first in the West in the regular season. Uh, it's, it's tough. It's tough because there's caveats again. But do you know who I'm going to say? I don't. I want to know if this is a hardcore normie pick again. Or the, the, the burgeoning normie pick. The budding normie pick. I want to see if you're going to make it. Oh, no. Is there... I see, as everyone knows, I haven't paid attention to what anyone else has said i deliberately go dark i go radio silence i have not seen a single prediction not one from anyone about 2024 basketball i have no idea what people are thinking and if it turns out they're thinking exactly what we're thinking we will take the show down we will record a new show for your pleasure um we don't want to do that to you new orleans pelicans is anyone talking about them as in uh, interesting you're pretty high on the pelicans uh no no I think there's a team that if the things go right, I think they could finish with the first seed. I think Zion Williamson playing like, let's go back to where, like 66 to 70 games. If he can play 66 to 70 games, if Brandon Ingram's healthy, if the whole thing is there and the team is pretty healthy, uh, I think they have a shot to be good enough to get into the 50s. Because when Zion, historically when Zion's on the court, he's extremely difficult to guard. And I would like to see him a little trimmer both in terms of his effectiveness right now, but also just long-term, like just carrying around 300 pounds is going to be hard on your joints and your body. But, um, I mean, Cody, you've seen him play when he's healthy, right? You've, you've, seen, you've seen the New Orleans situation when he's out there. Yes, Ben, I also remember the pandemic. Like, that was... The that, that was definitely the, the, the peak of the pandemic. That's, that's the last time I remember Zion being healthy, Ben. The pandemic. Yeah, remember that whole COVID thing that hit? No. It was a few few years ago at the turn of the, the decade. That was no. the last time Zion was was healthy, Ben. That was the last time. I think this is going That's to be a team where you and I probably are the most different. Because I feel I, I think I think one not mentality, thought process I have that makes me feel like the bad guy right now is I'm assuming poor health for people that have shown me some poor health recently. And I think Zion especially, watching from the uh, the, the preseason here, just some bits and pieces, I don't remember which game, but he took one shot in like the first half of one of the games. Maybe it was two shots in the first half. And he didn't seem as lithe as he used to be, Ben. This isn't a guy that I saw attacking the rim like, you know, I'm used to seeing when I go to YouTube and I type in 2020 Zion debut or he drops like four threes or something like that. Even the lobs he throws down, the dunks, he's missing like a solid vertical pop that I remember him seeing. Defensively, I thought he looked fairly disinterested at times during the preseason. I don't buy that this is the same Zion that we talked about when we were flirting with the best uh, finishers of all time. Wow. Wow. I feel like uh, we watched a completely different game. Interesting. A completely different game. Okay. Yeah. 
So you think he looks engaged. You think he looks physically good attacking the basket. You think defensively he looks a little bit more spry than in the past? No, I wouldn't say that. I just think he's. Okay. I just think he looks good enough to put together. He okay. Let's take a step back. Yeah. Do you think the idea of Zion Williamson putting together a season is a realistic thing at any point in his earlier mid twenties? Sure. Okay. And what do you think that looks like when he is able to be healthy enough to play sixty five to seventy five games? I mean, do you think? that he's going to be significantly worse in his impact than whatever you were alluding to earlier um, when you last thought he was healthy. I, I mean, I thought he started to look good at the beginning of last year. And I think when he was out there, the Pelicans had the one seed before he kind of shut it down for the rest of the year. Um, I mean, that's where my head is. You've got Brandon Ingram, you've got McCollum, you've got Fallon Chunas, you've got Herb Jones. You've got a few extra guys off the bench. You've got Dyson Daniels. You know, you have a team that once you plug in a player of Zion Williams's, Williamson's sort of nuclear destruction out there, I'm not that concerned about whether he's 100% compared to the last time he was healthy or 108% or 92% because I think they all get it done. I think they all make them a very, very interesting team. Now, you know, does that mean I'm saying healthy New Orleans is the one seed? Not at all. I'm saying when I look at the teams that could make a run and actually like stay healthy, I mean, let's put it this way. Do we think the Clippers could do that? Probably. <laughs> Probably. Okay. I would say it's more likely to me that Zion Williamson can put together a healthy season than both of the Clippers players putting together a healthy season and all of the other Clippers pieces working. I feel like New Orleans just kind of needs Zion to be out there. I Okay. I, I just feel like I'm being the bad guy right now. Ben, <laughs> the 2019-2020 season, he plays 24 games. You said, oh, I, if Zion can play 65, 70 games, it's great. 2021 season, he hits his career best with 61 games. 21-22, doesn't play at all because of the foot injury. Last season, 29 games. Ben, I, I don't know. I don't want to be like the rain on the parade thing. I love seeing Peak Zion. Legitimately, his debut game was one of the most fun times I've ever had watching a basketball game. Just the hype of him hitting those three and making that comeback. And it was just all great. And it's like, look, Zion has come. But I, I'm getting, I don't know, 29 games in the last two seasons? 90 total games in the last three seasons? I just I don't necessarily think that that's something that we can we can count on. And I know that's not hard hitting analysis, and I know people are coming here for harder hitting analysis than that. But I don't want to put a lot of time going into the what ifs when I don't necessarily trust that the what if is going to happen. Okay, I understand that. I understand that. Um, it it doesn't feel like a big what if to me because he's twenty three years old. And so there's definitely an injury concern and there's definitely uncertainty, but I feel like, I feel like you're coming at it from a perspective of like, I've not seen this thing repeatedly over and over again. So I don't know if it's ever going to happen. Like, I don't know if Greg Oden's ever going to really have a season that's good versus I'm seeing like, here's a young guy. He, a couple years ago played 60 something games. They've really been trying to work on his body and his mechanics I do trust at some point that it's reasonable to think that he'll have a full season. And so if we're assessing the teams right now, I think if he can do that, they have to be one of these teams that I consider for the top of the conference. That's, that's kind of the way I'm thinking about this, but let's, let's move on. Is there another team? Cause you were, you were thinking that I was going to say another team. Were you thinking I was going to talk about the Oklahoma city thunder? That's exactly who I thought you were going to Yeah, about. Yeah, they're in my next group. I don't – see, this is exactly why uh, maybe we diverge so much on the Pelicans because I think if the Pelicans click, and I think there's a reasonable chance that Zion can have a season, whether it's this season or next season or whatever, uh, they brought in James Borrego to help out as an offensive sort of coordinator there. I, I think there's enough there that you could go, whoa – New Orleans, and by the way, New Orleans in December, in the middle of December last year, they were the one seed in the West. They were 18 and 8 at the turn of the new year, kind of when Zion shut it down. They were like 23 and 12 or something. And then the then the season um, kind of fell apart from there once he was injured. But if you look at a team like OKC, I, anyone who listened to our summer stuff, the 12 people, they know 
they know we like some OKC around here. And um, and and Cody, have you seen Chet Holmgren play in the NBA? I, w- I watched a little bit of him. I didn't watch oh, too much of the Thunder. It, it's gorgeous. It's beautiful. Yeah, he's like a short Victor Wembanyama. <laughs> <It's> like... <laughs> Wait, so he's like a bull bull out there? No, no, he's he's great defensively, and he plays off ball, and he 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 shoots and he attacks, and uh, it's just he's such a great fit. He's such a great fit, and I am kind of like in the back of my head, I'm like, how good is Mark Dagnalt as a coach? Because I love some of the things I've seen in the last few years. I love the way they're starting to play and and kind of what they get out of their player uh, their players Jalen Williams of course is someone who's coming along is really interesting and dynamic uh, now you add Chet you've got Shea um, who's who's another guy there that I'm totally forgetting right now because I don't Lou know Dort? <laughs> Lou Dort Lou Dort was not was not who I was thinking of <laughs> Did you say um, Josh Giddy? Josh Giddy, that's who I was yeah. thinking of. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, Lou Dort was not was not who I was thinking of. But yeah, Lou Dort rules, man. I'm a Dort fan. Yeah, but I I I like the momentum that apparently they have with people. If if there's sort of a groundswell that thinks they're going to take a leap forward, I just have a hard time in this NBA with a team like that going to the one seed. Right, I think there, it's like your Minnesota thing. I think there's a difference there between we had a like Sacramento last year. Like we had a really good year. We finished in the three seed. We finished in the four seed. I could definitely see something like that from Oklahoma City. Um, but I think you're going to be really, really, really good to win the West as the one seed, and that feels a little bit more like a like a reach to me. One question I want to ask you, because I think especially at the beginning of the season when people are referencing the top 10 players in the league, I think there's like 25 players that end up being top 10 players in the league. But a guy that that, that comes up a fair amount is I, I hear a lot of talk that's like, are there eight guys better than Shea Gilgis Alexander right now? And I'm wondering, do you view going into the season that you think that Shea Gilgis Alexander is going to be like a fringe or even like a clear top 10 kind of guy going into the season? Uh, probably not for me. No, but that's a, that's largely a defensive and, and off ball thing. Um, but I mean, he's very good. He's he's very, very good. And I think when teams like that have a lot of success, unless it's very clear that there's a second player doing something usually in the box score that can rival someone like Shea, he's going to get all the flowers. So if Oklahoma City is like a top three or top four seed, just like you saw last year with either Sabonis or Fox, I think he's going to do very well in MVP voting and potentially do very, very well in all NBA voting, like maybe all NBA first team, depending on what the positional shakedown is. So, I mean, I think he's good enough to be there in that conversation. The other part of your question is you don't know who's going to age out during the year. So it's possible that, you know, at the end of the year, it might be someone I consider as a top 10 player. But no, generally, I'm thinking about more of the other guys. I think Shea continues the the more he can add value in other areas like using his length on defense and I know that's a a point of emphasis for Oklahoma City is trying to use all that length with Chet out there and Shea as one of the guards and Giddy and Jalen Williams and getting the gaps and helping the paint and deflect passes and things like that I think the more he can do that and add value there the better um, he will be as a player versus just like I I feel like at points in the past when Oklahoma City was more in a rebuild mode, is the rebuild over? Can we safely say that? I Um, think so. Yeah. I I think when they were more in a rebuild mode, he was having to do kind of like everything with the basketball. And I think there are diminishing returns there. Okay. I think this will be a good season to showcase that because as as Mike showed in the Thinking Basketball video, like they have a good combination of guys that can handle the ball. So I think it would do them – it would serve them well – to get Shea off ball and kind of move things around and, and shake up the offense a little bit more. So I do think that this is going to be a really uh, important prove-it year for Shea. And I think if he does end up being a top 10, top 8, if that's actually a thing that happens, then I think that's OKC's path forward to being like a one seed this season. Okay, so we've got Phoenix, we've got Denver, we've got the Lakers, we've got Minnesota, that's four teams. We've got the Pelicans, that's five teams. We've got uh, Oklahoma City. That's six teams. The, the Clippers, did we talk about the Clippers? Um, like, I think when Kawhi Leonard and Paul George play, they can be plenty good. 
How good? I don't know, because part of where we are in basketball today, part of parity and part of optimizing strategy and part of having so much skill on the court at all times is it's not easy to be successful without a good third, fourth, and fifth, fifth player. Like your, your strength of your unit can be brought down if you don't have the right piece to complement that, whether you need defense, whether you need a rim protector, whether you need a, another playmaker or something. So, you know, Russell Westbrook, does he fit that role? Um, you know, he's, he's I, I, I turn on the Clippers games in the preseason. He's taking dudes to the post and bully balling them. Is that the pathway to successful and efficient offense? I, I don't know. I think that's my question with the Clippers. Regular season, just from a health standpoint, I don't think, and the roster, the depth of the roster, I don't look at them in the category of the teams we just talked about. But if those are six teams, Cody, and those are six teams that don't have to play in a play-in game, do, do we now get to like the Clippers as a quote-unquote play-in team, but also if they're healthy and their stars are healthy, they can beat a lot of people? You're, you're making a face like you're going to douse more water on, on LA here. So I... I started this rule in the middle of last season. And because of that, I wrote one sentence in my notes for the Clippers. And with all due respect, like I mean this as politely as possible to the city of LA. I'm not talking about the Clippers. Just not talking about the Clippers. That's it. Everything that you said, that could be our analysis for the day. So the eighth team, <laughs> um, I actually have four more teams Eight, nine, ten, eleven. So one of these teams won't even make the play-in. Just chew on that for a second. Four more teams. One of these teams won't even make the play-in. Golden State, Sacramento, San Antonio, and Utah. One of those four teams won't even make the play-in. I think I would, off the top of my head, I would say San Antonio and Utah won't be making the play. And you can include you can include Dallas in there, by the way, and say okay. two of those teams won't make the play-in. Okay. San Antonio and Utah are not making the play-in. San Antonio and Utah are not making the play-in. Yeah. Who's going to win the rookie of the year? Ben, <laughs> talk about Normie, but we got to stop for a second. Ben, Victor <laughs> Wembenyama. <laughs> have, you, have you watched this human? I, I'm going to say human being. Have you watched this man play basketball? I don't know if he's like, a man. I don't know what he is. Have you seen anything like this yeah. ever? Someone get some kryptonite near him and see what happens. See if he starts sweating. But <laughs> yeah. there, the, thing, uh, the thing is with him, like the highlights are like the digs, the blocks, but then, like last night, I'm just I'm just scrolling the universe of Twitter, and there's a video that pops up of him stretching. It's it's literally him stretching. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And he yeah. goes down into the splits. That's it. That that's all I need to see. That I'm I'm so sold on this dude. Like I have no like I have no zag with Victor Wembanyama. Like this guy's unbelievable. He's the real deal. Lock him in for Rookie of the Year, Ben. I like this is this might. I don't know if this is a hot take. But I think there's a really good chance that he wins Defensive Player of the Year this year. I do not think he will be the best defensive player in the league. But I think, it, like, if I put, if I put money on things in a betting sense, I would put money on this right now. Victor Wembanyama has a really good chance to win Defensive Player of the Year. So you think there's a good chance? This is what I wrote down here. Ask Cody if he thinks there's a good chance San Antonio has a top five defensive rating. Ooh. Because Maybe. I okay, let me set the table. Let me set the table because yeah. not everyone is out here digging through preseason games, and, and this is what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to, you know, like analyze and inform and stuff like that. Um, they're not starting Victor Wembanyama at center. They're not playing him at center. So you have a seven-four player who is playing forward, okay, and they are starting Zach Collins. Basically, at center, you may remember Zach Collins. He of uh, speaking of people who are injured, many many injuries, uh, stopping and starting his career. Uh, he went to Gonzaga. He's still only twenty five. He's going to be twenty six this season. And Zach Collins, Cody, is six eleven. Hmm. And Zach Collins is looking good physically. He's he's looking good. So you're starting a six eleven guy at center. He's not super small. Um, 
Jeremy Sohan mm-hmm. is also playing out there. I don't know what position he's playing. I don't know if you call him point guard. I don't know what it is, but he's 6'8". So what the Spurs have in their at least theoretical starting lineup that we've been seeing in the preseason is you have basically a seven-footer, Zach Collins. I'm going to call him an eight-footer, Victor Wembanyama, because of his, his wingspan. Uh, and then Sohan... And then you just have two other wings. Probably their two best, well, certainly I think they're two best offensive players in that lineup, uh, your your friend Devin Vassell and Keldon Johnson. So I think in terms of like the play-in game question that we're talking about and how many wins can the Spurs get to and what tier of team they can be in, uh, to me the limiting factor is all about offense and like where's the offense come from, who creates offense, is Devin Vassell going to average 25 points a game this year? Like... Uh, when you bring certain players off the bench, maybe for offense, when you bring in Doug McDermott, things like that, what you know, what happens to the team's offense? How bad is it? Can it stay afloat? Because I think the defense, to your point, could be a legitimately really good defense. And if you're like, three, let's say three points better than league average defensively, now you got to be basically three points worse. You have to have like the 25th best offense to kind of be around a 500 team. They're a young team, so maybe they lose some close games and they underperform their point differential. But it feels to me like the Spurs are jumping from the bottom of the league to that like playoff cusp line because of this defense that they could have. Can I take on my little skepticism squirt gun that I like to do? Just come in and just... just because I have a couple thoughts, Ben. You are you are throwing water on on all these teams. Yeah, I really am. I really yeah. am. Zach Collins played 63 games last year. Right, so he was he was somewhat in the rotation. Um, the Spurs' relative defensive rating was uh, five points worse than league average. They had the worst defense in the NBA last season. No, I'm not. I'm not done yet. I'm not done yet. And some people might be like, "Well, oh, wait a second. Devin Vassell played like 38 games, 39 games last season. When he and Keldon Johnson were on the court together, only looking at those minutes, there's like 600 ish minutes they played together." They had a negative fourteen net rating. A negative fourteen net this rating. This is yes. This is a, this but, is last year's Spurs. Ben, if we it, like <laughs> listen, we're gonna go there. But if what you just painted happens, if their defense swings eight points, and it's actually three points better than league average, and their offense is is you know treading water, Victor Wembanyama might win MVP. Like I, that would be such they, a titanic they wouldn't shift. Give, they wouldn't give him MVP. So, but I'm saying, like that titanic shift that you just described. I don't think Victor Wembanyama is that good, and I don't know if any of the other guys are like that much better defensively. Unless somehow, like they're all like, all right, now that we have a team, let's actually see what we're able to do. Let's stay healthy. Obviously, it's something they can just decide to do. I, I don't quite think we're going to see this huge shift based on one season. Someone's just sent me live, right off the presses. The Darko win projection, Darko is the is the metric that is forward facing kind of predicting stats for for players uh, throughout the season. And they've they've sent me the win projections for every team in the league. And Cody, every single team in the league in these win pro- now this is just a statistical model, but it goes back to our earlier question in the show. Every single team is between 31 wins and 49 wins, except for two teams. Yep. One team is at 28, and one team is at 57 as an outlier. But like those models will be compressed a little bit, just like if you look at Vegas over-unders. Vegas over-unders don't love to say, like, this team's going to win 64 games. So I understand that. But this is just basically saying, like, there's a giant, giant, giant middle class. Uh, you know, like 32 to 48 wins for every, for 28 of the 30 NBA teams, at least how it shakes out on paper, at least what you could feed a model like that. But I, the Spurs are near the bottom of that model mm-hmm. because you can't feed the model Victor Wembenyama. It's, ne- <laughs> it's never seen Victor Wembenyama. And I'm loving watching everyone go through the experience that I got to go through last year, being able to scout and watch so many of his games in, in France and watch their run to the to the uh, championship round in, in their league that they played in. And uh, just, you know, you turn on the game and Clay Thompson goes to take a three and Victor Wembenyama's in the paint and he blocks the shot. And not even like by the fingertip, like he smothers it. And NBA players, the same thing happened in Europe when you watched 
the players have no ability to calibrate Victor's length on any plays. And I think as they do, you'll see things like the block numbers go down, right? Because they'll calibrate it. But then we'll get into all the stuff where it's like the hidden effect because they're just not shooting near him or they don't want to go in the paint near him. So we haven't even talked about a team like the Dallas Mavericks. Are we going to talk about them? Are we going to talk about the rest of the league today? This is we, oh, there's, we I think there's the there's, game there's like three teams in the East we have to talk about. I think that's it. Oh wow! Are okay. there teams wait, in the wait. East we have to talk about? For, for for the record, I just want to guess the two teams that are that are not within that range for the win projection. Yes, projections. there's one. There's one terribly low team and one terribly high team, and they're both in the East. So we could. Oh wait, yeah. Portland's listen, listen. No. I think there's a chance that Portland has the worst record in the NBA. Well, yeah, we don't have to talk about Portland is not I, they're not on the playoff radar for me. I'm yeah. just saying for the, for those Darko projections, I wouldn't be surprised if that was the case. Um before we go to the East, do you want to talk about who who else is left? Dallas, what did I say? Yeah. Dallas and Golden State and Sacramento. That's what oh I said. And and here's the interesting thing about Utah. I just want to I just want to get a little I just want to sneak Utah in. I just want to sneak Utah in. I like what Will Hardy's doing. I like their X's and O's. I like the talent that they have there and of course you love you love some walker kessler oh my god yeah 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 i think uh i, I don't think people realize just how good of a rim protector walker <laughs> yeah i served that up that was like an alley-oop right to cody <laughs> with no defense back all look, right listen da- I- look look dallas we got to go to the east dallas or um golden state or sacramento do you want to make a case <laughs> For one of the, do you think these teams will make the playoffs? Can I can I make a, a swerve right here? Really yeah. quick swerve. I don't know how much this team's going to compete. I'm going to whisper this, Ben. I'm going to whisper this one. I kind of like the Rockets. What's going on? I kind of like the Rockets. I think they're interesting. Yeah. Well, also, first of all, <laughs> they've won 59 games the last three be, seasons. Combined. I think they're going to be interesting. <laughs> 59 games the last three seasons. The worst the worst team that I could find was the Process Sixers, which won 47 wins in three seasons in a row. Like that's someone should hang that in some kind of ra- rafters. I don't know. Jabari Smith looks looks a little bit more improved. I think Fred Van Vliet. And, listen, stop they have it. A lot of stop re- it. This is really this is, Tate. F- <laughs> let's be F- F- Okay, this is They're last call. Okay. We're going to the East. Okay, <laughs> we're going to the East. You don't even want to talk about Dallas or Golden State or Sacramento. It's fine. Yeah, it's fine. What, we'll, we'll talk about them at some point. I, yeah. I have nothing against those teams. It's just we got to watch basketball tonight. Um, in the Eastern Conference, the Celtics were the team that was the only team. They are ten, like ten wins better than the next best team in a statistical model, mm-hmm. and it's one of those teams that you turn them on and you watch their starting five. And there have been better starting fives in NBA history and things like that. There have been starting fives with multiple all, you know, four all stars and all this stuff. Cody, I spent the summer watching dozens and dozens of 2000s Detroit Pistons games with Chauncey Billups, the all star, and Rip Hamilton, the all star, and Tayshawn Prince, who should be an all. Did he ever make an all star? I don't think he ever made an all star team, did he? Who, who was it? Tayshawn Prince. No, I don't think he was. Yeah. He was on uh, the Redeem team, though, I think, or the 2012 Olympic team. He should so. he should have made an all-star team probably yeah. at some point. Rasheed Wallace and Ben Wallace. So, look, mm. I just 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 to, te- just to temper expectations a bit, but the Celtics have five really good players in their starting lineup, and they fit really well together, and they're also kind of scary because they're all, like, big. Everyone's bigger than they should be. In- Porzingis is, like, 7'2", and Jason Tatum is, like, have you seen Jason Tatum? Lately, I turned the game on. The first thing they're talking about is the PRs he set in the weight room Ooh. in the offseason. He's huge. And then you have Jalen Brown, who's not exactly a, a, a tiny human being. Jalen Brown's like their smallest dude out there. It's like Drew Holiday. I guess Drew Holiday's shorter, but we all know Drew Holiday could leg press the earth if he needed to. <laughs> Uh, friend Scott Levine used to write about how Jason Tatum's lat development was a big part of his his game. So I'd like to know. I I, I don't. I want to know what those PRs are. Like, is it weighted pull ups? Because I think his lat pull down machine would be like he's got the pin at the very bottom, and he's like he's got like the skinny Y back tank, and he's just like <laughs> holding it at the bottom, just pausing there, and that that's what's going on. Celtics practices. It's just I, switching I, off and on. I don't think people realize how big and strong NBA athletes are. Um, 
Yeah. When, when I was in high school, I was working out with an NBA athlete one day and he just put, we were going around using machines and he just put the pin on the, he racked every machine and it wasn't even hard. And this person, if I told you this person, you would be like, he wasn't a very strong player. Um, yeah. So let's, let's continue. One day, I, that should actually be a podcast. We should talk about the fitness level of these athletes because I think that would be a really interesting topic. Not for today, Ben. Uh, the Celtics. I think yeah. something about for. Let's this, just squeeze this, it in. Squeeze it in in our short <laughs> preview here. That we're, one hour we got to the Eastern Conference. Let's do I a think, sidebar on fitness. I think everyone knew when they logged in. They're like, you know what? Lat pull downs are going to come in at the sixty minute mark. Like I know that's going to be happening. Uh, by the way, I'm a big fan of lat pull downs. I think people that can't get more than five pull ups in a set should probably do a little bit more lat pull downs <laughs> in their in their lives. That would probably help them a little bit more. Uh, poor Zingus. People have talked a lot about the the passing chops that Rob Williams brought at times. Like I don't think his his volume was super high, but I think Porzingis is kind of nice with the he sees someone cutting and makes the pass. I don't ever see him like creating the passing opportunity, but he can at least like hit cutters, and I think that's going to be interesting because that combined with like his I'm just going to catch the ball and fire it from 40 feet away, like that adds a lot of spacing dynam dynamism to the Celtics lineup. Um, I I want to see if they do a switch everything sort of scheme when Porzingis is out there. I think that's the one defensive part that I'm like, I don't know, this is a big drop, dude, and I don't know how mobile he wants to be on the perimeter. But beyond that, Ben, this is my one team I think can win over 60, t 60 wins. Yeah. Yeah, this team is uh, this team is totally loaded. Um, True the, the other team in the East that's kind of good is the Milwaukee Bucks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they've got the – they've got Dame Lillard. We've talked about it. Um do you see any of the other teams in the East challenging one of those two clubs? Like, could Cleveland have a good enough regular season in your head to challenge one of those two teams for the pole position? Is there any other team? I have Philadelphia written down here because they have Joel Embiid, and Joel Embiid is is really an incredible singular force. But, mm -hmm. um, I mean, you tell me. What, what, what else is cooking for you? One of my hot takes, Ben, is that I think that the Cavaliers will have the second seed in the East. Second seed. Okay, so you think one of those teams, even maybe the Bucks, you think the Bucks will be the team that will fall off. But you think one of those two teams is going to open the window for a team like Cleveland to pass them. I don't even know if there's an open the window. I just think the Cavaliers had a really good regular season team last year. They had the best defense by like a full point. I don't see any reason why that should be any different. And I know there's been a lot of chatter about Donovan Mitchell, the people that are like plugged in. I don't care about those conversations. I genuinely don't. He looked pretty engaged defensively during the preseason. There are times where he's making plays at the rim, just disrupting passes with his length. Like this is a guy when he has people like Evan Mobley and Jared Allen behind him. I kind of believe in his ability to do a little bit more defensively. The Max Struess move, that's the exact kind of forward that they needed next to them. Like I don't think he's a panacea. Like it's not going to solve all of the issues that the Cavaliers had but this is already an excellent regular season team and I see no reason why that would be any different I expect another at least semi leap from Darius Garland like I'm not expecting him to go from whatever he was to like an MVP level but you know shoring up on the margins I want to see Evan Mobley develop more of an offensive game I don't know if I saw much of that during the preseason but the, the NBA season is a long time uh, but if everything stayed the same they should still be competing with the top four seed anyway I have two other teams that I think could be, let's say, interesting. I don't know where this gets you in the East. I don't know if it gets you a four seed. I don't know if it gets you a three seed. But there's two teams I came out of the preseason scratching my head about and writing some notes about. The first one is the Indiana Pacers. With Tyrese Halliburton, not sure if you've heard of him. Um, and then they've added Bruce Brown. The the player you alluded to one hour and 20 minutes ago when we started the podcast and we're talking about some of the teams in the West. You know, I just think they're I just think they're solid. I think they're solid. I don't know what it is. I think they are a team. You're you're you're, you're waving your hand. You, what? What? I'm not Tell me. I'm not sold on the Pacers. I'm not sold on the Pacers either. I just oh, have okay. you seen the rest of the East? I, I think the East is kind of interesting. Well, interesting in what sense? I think there's going to be a, a healthy competition to make the playoffs. Oh, okay. So you, you kind of see, once you get to like the four seed, that four to ten is all very kind of lumped together as, as lower quality teams? 
I think there are some teams that have the chance to be quite a bit better than they were last year, or at least about as good as they were, shoring up a couple things from last year. And uh, I don't necessarily know if everyone that made the playoffs last year will make it again. Like, I think there's some stiff competition to make it there. And I don't think, like, I like the Pacers. I like the moves they made, right? But I don't know if they improved so much that I think that they're going to be in contention for a playoff spot. I mean, okay. like, even last year, I think their they're, they're net rating when Tyrese Halliburton was on the court was like negative one. Am I making this up? Yeah, they were negative one when he was on the court. It was like a plus four-ish on-off signal. It's just not a huge signal for when your best player's out there. And I really like Bruce Brown, but I don't know if he's going to have the same kind of synergy as without Jokic. Like, Bruce Brown is great, but I just, you know, the magic he had with Jokic was off the charts. So, uh, I don't know. Obi Toppin's good, but he likes to fire a lot of threes, stand in the corner, set some screens. He's flexible defensively. Uh, Unless Andrew Nebhart comes out and he's like an all-star level player, like, I don't necessarily think they'll be a playoff team. Wow. Okay. No, I think they're solid. I think they're solid. Just to be clear, I am not saying that the Pacers are going to win 54 games. Yeah. Um, I just there, there are two teams that are interesting to me after the top teams in the East, after Cleveland and Milwaukee and Boston. Indiana is one. Hmm. The other one is even more interesting to me. And just receiving this message about the Darko projections, Darko statistically loves this team as well, which makes them even more interesting. They have no spacing. I have no idea what's going on. They start like four big men. They may crush the league defensively. It's the Toronto Raptors. That was not the direction I expected you to go. No, I am zigging and zagging all over the place, throwing you curveballs today. Um, they Fred Van Vliet is out. Dennis Schroeder's in. And then they're starting... OG Ananobi and Scotty Barnes, not in the front court, not as like their big men in the front court in 2024. Those are their wings. The front court is Pascal Siakam and, you know, maybe Jakob Pertl, maybe and maybe uh, they, they started Boucher the other night, whoever, whoever they throw in there, okay? You could throw Precious, Precious Achua in there. Sometimes Siakam plays center. Jalen McDaniels is there. Tad Young is there. Tad Young. This, this, this is like a... Uh, the actualization of Project 6-9, it's happening. It's happening, Cody. And in a weird way, like, I watched them a lot in the preseason and I didn't notice this. I think it's just because they played their players so much in the preseason, but they ended up crushing people when their starters were on the court during the preseason more than any other team in terms of uh, point differential. I, they're just a very interesting team to me. I would not be surprised if they won 36 games. I, I think what's tough is this team was really hard to analyze last season because the vibes were just so off with them. Like, everyone was on the trading block. It didn't seem like people were getting along with Nick Nurse. However, Nick Nurse is like a genius-level coach that was doing some things, but he seemed to rub people the wrong way. Fred Van Vliet's gone, so I don't know what that does for their offense. I, there's just a lot of questions that I have for this team. I sort of, conceptually, I'm a big fan of everything you said. Like, I'm interested to see what Darko Rayakovich is going to do as their coach out there. Like, what sorts of schemes is he going to bring? Is he going to be able to do some magic with this, like you said, spaceless lineup? Uh, is OG Ananobi, like, is OG Ananobi going to get it traded? How long is he going to be on the trading block? Is Siakam going to be another all end, like, all NBA third team kind of guy? Is, is Scotty Barnes going to be good again? Like, I don't know. There's, I have too many questions for this team. Have you, have you seen... OG Ananobi, have you seen him? Are we talking? Are we going back to the weight room again? We, <laughs> we have to go. We have to just do a. We have to do a, just a quick exit, real quick, to just talk about the weight room. There's um, no quick exit to the weight room, Ben. He's enormous. What's going on with him? He looks like the Hulk. Yeah. No, that dude's incredible. I think, like he doesn't I, even move like he used to when he came in. He kind of like he kind of like uh, lords over the court. When he bounces it, he's like six. He's like six five, going on eight three. There's a couple of dudes whose calves like really stand out when they're <laughs> running around on the court. I think Bradley Beal secretly has some really like standing out calves. OG Ananobi is one of them. I would love to see this guy go through a leg workout. Like that should be an NBA video. That would get like four billion views. Is if if it was just like here's an hour of OG Ananobi going through a leg workout, that would be unbelievable content. Because I, I think we'd be blown away by just how many times he's going to rep 315. Like, listen, I don't know. Is he doing, like, Widowmakers at 315? I would love to see that. Listen. Listen. This has gone off the rails. <laughs> Widowmakers. 
Uh, even in the Gallon fitness, a that's a hard, that's a hardcore cut. Even in the fitness community, no one does those anymore. No, that's cardio for people these days. <laughs> um, that's 10 reps. So, okay. Isn't it 20? I think it might be 20. Four by 20. Is it, I, I don't even know how many sets it is. Do you think you drink a gallon of milk a day? That's <laughs> Stop it. This is too much. This is too much. <laughs> are there any other teams in the East? Let's just, are we ending the show? Who else is no. in the East? No, 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 no. We got, we got a couple other. Okay. You're going to, your whole, the whole show, the whole show, I've been brimming with optimism, excited about this tip off and you've been throwing water on me like a California firefighting patrol. And now I've been waiting for this moment. I get to do the same thing to you. So I will tee you up and then I'm going to send it back in your face. Uh, just a sec. Warm up the neck here. I'm going to lean in. Orlando Magic hashtag are making the free, playoffs. Hashtag free Franz. Hashtag free Orlando Franz. Magic. They're making the playoffs this year. Not even. I'm not even talking playing. They are making the playoffs this year. Yeah, yeah. That's where I disagree. Okay, tell me why. Why? Why do I have to make the negative case? You tell me why they're going to make the playoffs. That's all I've done is make the cases. Okay. So I've, I'm trying to do like a tally of all of the players I fawned over on this team. So I can try and make a new angle. I don't know how much Gary Harris love I gave, but you go back to last season. Like this is revitalized Gary Harris. No, There's a no. game against Miami at one point in March. He rotates over and blocks bam no. at the rim. Bam rotate rolls. And Gary Harris is like, Nope, I'm Sidney Moncrief meets him at the rim, throws it back. He shot 43% on threes last season. We talked a lot. Cole Anthony is my one of my breakout candidates. Wendell Carter does not get enough love, right? Initially, I thought maybe his 35% on wide open attempts was like pretty weak. But comparatively to other centers, I actually think his three-point percentage is like, that's going to give you a little bit of spacing chops, right? I think he's a great little defensive guy, especially when you have Bancaro and, and Fra- Franz out there doing their thing. Is, Ban- is Bancaro, Boncaro? Bon- yeah, what, you, what, like, you like Boncaro's defense? I do like Moncaro's defense. Okay. All right. I disagree a little bit there. Okay. Um, but I have a question for you, speaking of defense, because I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit you with the tough stuff, okay? Okay. I'm going to give you want. the tough stuff. All right. Uh, how many minutes per game will John Isaac play? Slash, what position will John Isaac play? John Isaac is in my Clippers slash Zion category. <laughs> oh my god! I, I Ben, like I, I'm sorry, I'm the bad guy with health right now. This is coming from somebody that like bounces personally bounces from injury to injury, and I know it seems like people have a predisposition for injuries, right? I just I don't know. I'm I'm kind of done. I'm kind of done figuring out how much John Isaac's gonna play. Okay, then then it's very hard to sell me on this team being a good defensive team. I just have a very hard time with it. I think John Isaac needs to play uh, for them to really be a good defensive team. He still looks very capable defensively. Now, if you're saying you're going to get Jalen Suggs and you're going to get Franz Wagner and you're going to get Wendell Carter, um, and that's going to get you all the way there, I, I just don't think it's enough. Well, I think this is the kind of team where when you look defensively, there's just not a lot of clear negatives, right? I think Cole Anthony is a good, tenacious little defender. I think Markel Fultz is a tenacious, long defender that's out there. I don't know who else you said, but there are other guys out there. They're all good defenders. I think Wendell Carter is probably above average to a degree. I think I think Boncaro has a chance to be a good... I think he's shown some rim protection chops. He can rotate and be a big player out there. I don't necessarily know if he's going to move the needle yet defensively, but he has the potential to do that. I think Franz is a solid defender. They just don't really have weaknesses on the defensive end, and I think that in itself is a boon for their team. Okay, right, but they were right around league average last year defensively. Sure. Okay, um, how are they going to get to being a top defensive team? What's going to change? Wait, top defensive? I'm not saying they're going to be like a top five defensive team. Well, if we agree then, if you and I agree that they are only going to be around league average defensively, how do they get to be one of these top six teams without being a good offense then i think they're often i think they're gonna be like okay in both of these things right like okay so you think you so you think the offense is really gonna take a leap yeah i do because they were i think they were near the bottom of the league i can't remember anything that happened last year i don't know who won the title last year that's way too far back to try to they were 26th 26th in offense last year 111.6 offensive rating with a 115 league average that's not good um, it's not good because I don't think they have many good decision makers. I don't think they have a ton of shooting. You look at Markel Fultz, you look at Jalen Suggs, 
uh, Boncaro, and as you said, even Wendell Carter Jr., which is decent for his position, is not a lot of skilled shooting on the court. So I think something needs to change. I think you need someone to come in and really succeed at point of attack. I think you need an X's and O's change that unlocks some of the talent, whether it's playing at more pace or playing with a different, maybe playing more through the elbow, some more more kind of like delay, DHO, big man hub kind of sets. You got to change something. You got to do something. And that would, what, maybe kick the offense up to average? That's where I have a hard time with Orlando. I know you love them. I do. But that's where I have a hard time actually seeing what what is it that gets you there. Is, does Franz make a huge leap? Do they run everything through Franz Wagner? Here's the hard-hitting analysis that everyone has been waiting for for an hour and 20 minutes. Ben, can't I just believe in the magic of continuing chemistry? Like, isn't that something that a guy that just wants to see teams stay together can believe in for a second? Uh, we did not expect to get this deep in the show and switch to Cody going with an old McDonald's theme asking me if I believe in magic. That's <laughs> We did not expect that. Um, I just think collectively they'll all be a little bit better. They'll know how to play with each other a little bit more. And uh, I don't know. I, I just believe in it, Ben. I believe in it. How many games did they win last season? Do we know that? that? Didn't you tell me that you don't care about last season? I'm going to repeat that right back to you. This is the Spurs thing. The, the Magic, except the Magic were a lot better than the Spurs last year. The Spurs, the Spurs are very different this year. Yeah, because they have Victor. <laughs> yeah, they're very, they're very different. Everything's different. Everything. Everything's hey, different. Let me ask you about another team. Let me in ask the you East, about, yeah, a team in the East. Yeah. Tell me why. Okay, actually, let me lay out the case for you. Brooklyn Nets. Who are Mikael who? Bridges? The Brooklyn yeah. Nets. Yeah, they're okay. But, Mikael Bridges yeah. finished second in Defensive Player of the Year in 2022. Well, that's not right, but let's keep I'm going. I'm not finished. Oh, I'm not finished. Ben Simmons finished second in Defensive Player of the Year in 2021. Something Claxton is a top-tier defensive player. I thought he was right outside of all defensive type mm-hmm. of potential last year, but he's getting there. Mm-hmm. Uh, Dorian Finney-Smith, he's a yeah. great all-around wing defender. Can this team be the best defense in the league? They could. Yeah. Yeah. They could be. They could be. I'm not sure they will. Yeah. But they've got they've got a really cool defensive construction. Ben Simmons they, looks a little better physically. Yeah. I think they could be. It's going to be interesting to see what that is from a night to night basis in the regular season because I think it's good. And the question is, could it be great? Uh, you know, switch everything, ra- rangy, wingy guys. I I think to some degree a lot of it hinges on. Ben Simmons' health, because you want someone that can get into the point of attack to complement some of the other players, right? I mean, maybe Mikel Bridges is the one that gets into the point of attack more. I don't know. But they I'd say they could be. But I think they'll be good defensively. That's what I anticipate. And it's hard for me to see them being really good offensively. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I don't think they have the chance to be the best defense, but I just don't, I don't quite think. I think some of these guys are maybe – a tad overrated? Can I say that out loud? Maybe a tad overrated? Def- not Nick Claxton. That dude absolutely rules. But I think there's a good chance that this team's a bottom five offense. Like, I, I don't quite see where the offense comes from to really juice it beyond 25. Let's see. You got you got the, any any other teams we need to talk about in the East? I mean, you got the Hawks. You got the you got the Knicks. These teams will be competitive, I think. But um, who's the big team that sneaks up on us this year? Who's the who's the big surprise? Uh, well, I said Orlando. I think the Magic will. Okay. Least. Do you... Can I give you another hot take? It, today's, I think, a hot take day, right? I think everyone forgets the preseason predictions, and then we can just kind of pretend it never happened later. Um, I don't think the Miami Heat make the playoffs this year. That That is a... Uh, oh, you're on fire today. I'm just, you know, I just don't think they make the playoffs. I don't know what it is about them. They never... I mean... <laughs> Well, some years they have really good, really good regular seasons. A couple of years ago they did. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, I don't know. I don't know what okay. to do with them. I don't know what to do with this sort of log jam of teams in the Eastern Conference. That's why I said there's only two teams in the Eastern Conference. Oh, there's actually a team. Okay, here's a legitimate team that might actually finish in the top half of the East just by nature of the East isn't great. How do you feel about the Knicks this year? Yeah, I was just saying the Knicks, the Knicks and the Hawks, I think, are going to be yeah. competitive. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
Any any dark horse MVP candidates? Dark horse MVP. Okay. Who's who, who's who, getting who's aging out this year? Who's aging out while you're doing your hot takes? I'm I'm trying to pull up some uh some MVP voting from last year. Who who finished like who do you remember finishing high in MVP voting? No idea. That no idea. That's why I think if Zion's healthy and they make a run to the top, something like that could happen. I think that I think did Joel Embiid win MVP last year? Yeah, he did. Yeah. Because yeah. the top three were him, there was Giannis, there was Jokic, um, Tatum. I think Booker. Oh, Tatum. Tatum. Yeah. Wonder if they'd give it to Tatum. Because they'll be the best team by like eight wins or something like I that. Don't know. I think that's a good enough reason that people would give it. Unless they give it to Drew Holiday, which they probably should. Now we're just sitting around like old men wondering <laughs> wondering what could be. Um, and is there anything else we need to know about the season before we we wrap this up? Do you have like major predictions? Like, I first of all, Embiid can't win MVP this year. It's just like that the media is not going to give it to him. I think the 76ers are in a weird log jam. I'm not saying that he won't deserve it. Like, oh, I, I totally disagree happens. with that. Really? I totally disagree with that. The expectations of MV, MVP heavily dictate who gets the narrative and who wins it. And with James Harden, if James Harden ever plays in Philadelphia and he leaves, and Philly is still in like a top two or top three seed, and Embiid has a crazy season, I think he could win MVP easily. I think there's a bad taste in people's mouths about uh, Embiid in the playoffs because I don't think he quite lived up to his regular season expectations, and part of me feels like people are going to hold it against him. They may, yeah. yeah. Um, We've I don't know that if that means Jokic well. wins MVP. Like, there, I think there's a chance that Jokic has another MVP season. Um but other than that, I really don't. I think there's a chance Kevin Durant, like if the Suns finish the top two, last year he like in 56 games or 47 games, whatever he played, he was like a 30 points on plus 10 efficiency. There's a chance Kevin Durant's a dark horse. Kevin MVP. Durant, I, I like that one, Cody. Yeah. And that would be such a narrative shifter in the sense that his first MVP would be in 2014 and his second MVP would be in 2024. <laughs> I like that. I like that. Yeah. That would, that would be... Uh... That'd be crazy. Um, you know what's a team in the East that has a couple lineups that I'm I think would be fun to watch? I think the Wizards will be rolling out some fun things. <laughs> you're, I think the you're, it, uh, is Jordan Poole on the bench in those lineups? Because yeah, hey, let, let me read you the lineup. Oh, Tyus okay. Jones, yeah. DeLon Wright, yeah. Kyle Kuzma, yeah. Danny Avdia, yeah. Daniel Gafford. Yeah, you s- I'm logging to every minute of that line. Yeah, you swap out you swap out Bilal Koulibaly for one of those players, and I'm there. Oh, I'm, who, who, who I'm do down. you go in for? It doesn't matter. I just want to watch him play over the other players. The thing is, if you turn on the Wizards and Jordan Poole's on the court, the odds that he's going to take a shot are very high. Yeah. Let's you know what's the team light. we didn't talk about that people probably are angry we didn't talk about? I don't know. They're probably going to be angry about everything. We didn't mention even we didn't even mention the Grizzlies. We didn't? I don't think so. Oh, you just pencil them in for like a good regular season. I'm a little nervous about the Jawless twenty five games. And and no Steven Adams. Yeah, oh, that's a plus minus God right there. That's why we're not talking about the Grizzlies. It's 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 a little too depressing. I mean, there is the question of like what Jaron looks like without sort of that big big bruising guy in the middle to help him. Um, you know, we've seen this many, many times throughout history where you've got a player like that. You want to unleash him on the weak side. You don't want him necessarily banging against other centers. So that's a question, what they're going to look like without jaw, no ties Jones, all these questions. But I mean, I, I still think they will be, I think they will be pretty competitive in the regular season. Yeah, I agree with that. But I think at these 25 games, I wouldn't be surprised if their, their offensive rating was like, two points worse than league average i don't know i don't know what to do with them we just we have to end the show so the season can start <laughs> and i i really don't know i don't know i don't know what to do with this nba season i have uh yeah i don't know who's your champ of the nba cup oh. <laughs> to <laughs> do the denver nuggets uh retake their glory i have no idea um, I have, I, th- I think I have my, my sort of inner tier teams coming into the season yep. are the Celtics and the Bucks in the East and the Nuggets. And I'll include, I'll include the Suns and the Lakers in the West. I'll okay. make that 
five to start. That's kind of where my head is at right now. I'll accept yeah. that. I think that's good. Yeah, you'll you'll accept the Lakers in that group. Yeah, whatever. It's early. I'll accept anything you say. You've allowed me to say some wild things today. So, <laughs> well, I didn't allow you. You just did it on your own. <laughs> we'll see what we'll see what the repercussions are. Uh, to support this show, check out Patreon.com/slash Thinking Basketball. We have uh, extra content there and live Q and A's that we do every month in a, in a Discord community. And uh, I'm sure other things I'm forgetting because we're we're about 50 minutes from tip off and. I need to go. I need to go take a nap and uh, charge up and get ready. I can't. Be- I can't believe we're starting the season. I, I. I can't believe this is happening. It's not even Halloween. I know. Yeah. yeah. Is that earlier than usual? I feel like this is usually when it's they happening. used. They used to start it around Halloween, and then a couple years ago they did this strange October fifteenth jump, and now they've like met in the middle, and they do, like a week before. Halloween, and I think there's two games tonight, and then everybody in the association plays tomorrow night except like one or two okay. teams. I don't think the Bucks play till like Thursday, right? Oh, wow. I, I don't know. I'm just looking at today. Do you remember the preseason game like 15 years ago where they played it on like an aircraft carrier? Yeah, I think there, was was also the a co- there was a college game they played on an aircraft carrier. There's not enough games like – in weird settings. I think Draymond Green was in that game on an aircraft carrier. Really? Yeah. Yeah. I can't remember. They've played, they've played, uh, didn't they play a game in like a huge football stadium and set an attendance record? Was that an all-star game or did I make that up? Like in Orlando? I thought Orlando had, or maybe Texas. Somewhere in the South. I don't know. This is the content people are here for though. Um, That's it. Let's, let's end the show. How do I end this show? How do I get out of here? I don't know. Who do you think draws a bigger crowd, NBA All-Star or Taylor Swift? The NBA Cup Finals on <laughs> December 7th in in Las Vegas. <laughs> Tune in for that. Thanks thanks for listening to this one. Hope you enjoy the year. Thanks for uh, spending time with us and look forward to getting into the season once, once actual basketball starts. So uh, thanks as always and hope you're having a great day. 